So collect a jelly bean. Well, let's in fact collect two. And now we want to kill the actor. Okay, so it's showing us two over 20. Now when it resets, it's still showing us two over 20. Okay. Which we wanted that to go back to zero out of 20. So now it's three, my character dies. I go to click the play again, and it's still showing us three out of 20. Okay, so we want to reset this so that it goes back to zero. In order to do this, we're gonna to go to the GUI behavior. Okay, this is the scene behavior, GUI. Under created. Game attributes, setters. We're simply gonna set Jelly Bean to zero when the GUI is created. Because this is attached to the scene, it's the first thing that is uh, created when the scene loads. So it will always reset the jelly beans back to zero when it reloads. Great, so it's showing zero out of 20. Let's collect a jelly bean. And let's die. And it goes back to zero. Okay, very important that we do this step. I'm gonna cover some common errors you may encounter while using Stencil and how to fix them. On the events for level one, if we create a new event, let's say an actor enters a region, you can see that it needs to be configured and it lets you know what it is expecting. The specific actor in the first dropdown and the specific region in the last dropdown. If I add a reload command and I choose to leave the parameter blank, this will cause an error. And actually I'm gonna configure the event but if I left the dropdowns in their default state, that would also cause an error. So now when I try and play the game, it will pop up with an error. It's a compilation error. It's saying that there are not enough arguments. In other words, something has been left blank. Click OK and it highlights the error for you in red. Now if I enter a number here and test the scene again, it should now work fine. Now this was just a test, so we can delete this event. Now add an updating event, which is going to be running every frame. Drag in the set X for actor from the actors category. You can type in a value in the parameter, but don't assign it to any actor from the dropdown. So test the scene again and this time it should throw out a different error. So this one looks different. This is a null object reference error. This means it cannot run the command because it doesn't know which actor to run it on. Anytime you don't configure the dropdowns of events or commands, this causes a null exception error. To fix it, simply choose the actor from the dropdown. We have now completed level one and we will start to build level two in the next section. But first, let's import the new actor for this level, which are the spikes. Create a new actor called spikes, and then import the image, which you can find in the resources for this session. This needs splitting up. It is four rows and two columns. Now it's playing quite quickly, so let's slow it down by double clicking on the middle frame, frame four, and changing its duration to about 800 milliseconds. Now the spikes move up and then pause in the middle before going back down again. Keep looping checked as it should continuously play and then call this animation spikes. Copy frame zero and create a new animation and paste it in as a single frame. Call this still and then uncheck looping. Now adjust the collision for the spikes animation. Height of six should do. Then move down on the Y position to about 24. And you can zoom in on the image to check its alignment. Now it needs pushing down a bit. So 26. 
Delete the collider on the still animation, as it shouldn't damage the player when the spikes are not up. And set the physics to cannot move. Now we want to move between still and spikes in a continuous pattern for the entire level. Still should actually be the default animation. Click on spikes and count how long the animation lasts. Now it's about 1500 milliseconds, so about 1.5 seconds. Click on events to create the code. And then we, add, we need to add a time event every n seconds. Type in the 1.5 seconds to match the animation duration. Drag in a conditional if statement and an equals comparison. Go to the actors category and the draw section and drag the current animation into the left parameter. Then you want to check if it is equal to still by typing the name in the right parameter spelled the same as the animation name. It will only work if it's spelled exactly the same. Now add a switch animation and type spikes, the name of the other animation. Go back to flow and drag in an otherwise condition. So this means that if the current animation is not equal to spikes, it should now set the animation to spikes. This will create a continuous cycle that changes every 1.5 seconds between the still and spikes animation. Uh, second animation should actually be still, not spikes. It will continuously loop between the two of them. Create a new scene and call it level 2. Set the width to 84 and then change the background colour to black. This level is slightly longer than the first level. We can now link level 2 to the end of level 1. So do this by going into the door code actor behaviour and changing the switch to scene to level 2. When you've completed the first level, it will nicely progress into the second level. This level is also going to have a health pickup, so we need to set up that art actor. Set the collision to be a sensor, so that it doesn't actually stop the player from walking into it. And then set the physics to cannot be pushed, and also can rotate is set to no. In this level, the two, two new actor types are going to be the spikes and the health pickup. So each level will introduce something new to make it more challenging as the player progresses. But you will find the level 2 layout in the, in, in the resources for this session to lay out level 2 according to the image. Now you've already done this for the first level, you're just going to repeat this again for the second level. Remember that you can add a grid to the screen to help you match the layout. And set up the art pickup so that it adds one to your health. And also set up the spikes so that they take one from your health. Now we need to add the GUI icons. So open level one from the scenes. We need each of these to be in roughly the same place. Click on the Jellybean GUI and you can make a note of the coordinates by moving your mouse cursor over the top of it. Create a new layer called GUI in the level 2 scene. Then you want to place the Jellybean GUI in roughly the same place using the coordinates that you've just seen. And that's close enough. This ensures that it doesn't interfere with the GUI text that will be generated when we play the scene. Now repeat the process for both the heart and the key icons.
Open the events on level one and right click on the created event on the left and copy. Then paste this into the events panel on level two. Notice how it should copy all the code over. Now just choose the three icons from your screen to anchor them into screen space. You should have included the GUI behavior into level two, just like the one that appears on level one. Now you can test the scene to ensure that everything works at the moment. Everything is moving properly and the damage is working. The icons and the text are all in the right place and stay on the screen. This is a moving platform, but this one should be still. And I think all the other platforms are also moving. You should also have the spikes and the heart in place. Move your player over to the spikes to test that they actually work. Now the health is at three and we expect it to go down by one when we hit the spikes, which it does. Now move the player over to the end of the level in order to test the health pickup. Health starts on three and we expect it to go up by one when we pick up the heart. Now I got some damage, but the heart increased it back to three again. So open the player damage actor behavior and you can see that the spikes damage is an exact duplicate of the water drop damage. Now I've created a new behavior called pickups. Yours might be called something else, but that's fine. And it uses a collision event, which is a collision with actor type. So when self hits a heart, it adds one to the health and destroys the last created actor, which is the heart. Now this is attached to the player character. Now is a good time to do a play test on level two to check for bugs or issues. So first open the actor, that's the player, uh, to temporarily deactivate the player damage behavior. This is so that we don't constantly take damage and we don't get killed during the testing. Open level two. And we need to put the player back to the beginning of the scene. Now test the scene. Do a run through of the level, making sure that you can easily reach the other side. Okay, so I can see that there is no way I can jump on that platform. So it needs moving. You can also see that this flame or character is traveling through the platform. Click on the flame or enemy and click on the inspector window at the top right. And then click customize the behavior and we can adjust the left and right distances to about 40. We also need to move this platform more to the left so that we can jump on it. You can even slow it down by customizing its behavior. Slow it down to about six. Now 
And let's move the player into place to test that you can jump on the platform. So test the scene. That's weird. Uh, the player is not where I put him in the scene. Okay, bizarre. Now I can jump on the platform easily. But I can't make the jump onto the other block. So try shifting the moving block over to the left a bit and also this jelly bean. And let's modify the left and right distances of the wooden platform to about 110 each way. Try moving the player down here to see if he starts there when I start the scene. And he still starts in the wrong position. This is very weird. So it looks like the adjustments I made have now slowed the platform down. So once again, I can't actually jump on it. A lot of this is trial and error until you get it just right. If I move the player up here, maybe it will start there in the play mode. Let's also speed up the platform to about seven to accommodate for the increased distances that we put in there. And he still starts in the wrong place. Great, this is much better. And they can also jump on the block at the other side. The key works and it is displayed and the elf has now gone up to four. Put the player back to the beginning of the level and let's see if the flame or enemy movement has been fixed. It has. The enemy is not going through the platform anymore. And that looks really good. Finally, go back to the player and reactivate the player damage behavior. Now we need to add a door region on level two in order to activate the messages on the screen. So open level two. Click on the region button and draw a region box around the door. You can return to world editor by clicking the world icon. And just as we customize the door in level one, we need to do the same in level two. Click on the door and customize the code. Now choose the region. There are 25 jelly beans on this level. Remember to count them in the scene to make sure this is correct. Otherwise you would have problems, uh, coding problems when winning the level. Test the scene to make sure it works. Right, that works. 
we want to start using attributes to be able to reuse code on several levels and change certain things like the time and the jelly beans. At the moment, there are no attributes to change. We can see that minutes is actually a global attribute and that you cannot change that from the inspector. This is set up in the settings. Now actually this is zero to begin with. It's set to two from the created event and it's much better to have this as a variable attribute. So create a new attribute and call it time start and choose the number type. We can now replace this hard coded value of two with the variable time start attribute that we can set in the behaviors window of each level. And you might have to restart the level to see the update. Type three in here. And now time should start at 3 minutes and 59 seconds for level 2. And test that to make sure that that's the case. Great, so now we can use this same code on different levels and input different times for each. Remember to set the time start for level one back to two. Two minutes and 59 seconds. Continue to edit the GUI behavior. We have another hard coded value for total jelly beans on the display. This will have to change for each level. So create a new attribute and call it total beans. Ensure it is a number type. And drag this out temporarily and find the text and text from the numbers and text category. And then you want to enter space slash space in the left and then the total beans in the right parameter. Go to attributes and total beans. This is called concatenating, where you are taking a few things and you're putting them together as one. In this case, the jelly bean count, then the slash, and then the total beans number. Reopen level two to see the behaviors window update. And now we can type 25 in the total bean slot. Do the same for level one. And remember that this is 20 in the total bean slot. So test the scene to make sure it works correctly. Great, that looks good. And test level one to make sure that this one says 20 and not 25. Great, so attributes are a very important part of game design coding, allowing us to reuse code for all of our levels. Open the door, open behavior. And here we can see a hard-coded switch to scene, meaning it will always load level 2 on every level. So create a new attribute called scene and make it a scene type. You now drag that into the switch to scene slot and this can now be set up in each level to load the next one. Open level one and click on the door in the level and you can now see a scene slot which you can click on and set the next level to load. And that's in the inspector. So 
So here we can set a different level, the same code, but doing two different things. Create a new scene and call it level three. Set it, set its width to 122 and set the background color to black. This level is much longer than the previous two. Your assignment is to lay out this level. You will find the level three layout image in the resources for this session. You will also bring in the button graphic as well as the crumbling block graphic, which are both in the resources for this session. And there is also the time pickup graphic as well. Bring all three graphics in as actors and the crumbling block should be animated. We'll also need to set up the GUI graphics in the same way that you did for level one and level two. You should now have brought in the three new actors, the crumbling block, the push button, and the time pickup. Inside the crumbling block, we have the animated crumble, and each frame is set to 150 milliseconds. Looping is unchecked, so it ends on a blank frame. There is also a still of frame zero that is set to be the default. It has a standard square collider for both animations. And under physics, it is set to cannot be pushed and can rotate is set to no. Push button has two animations, off and on, both single frame animations, and off is set to be the default. The collisions have been resized for each animation to match the graphic. Physics for this are also cannot be pushed and cannot rotate. Time pickup is a single frame with a square collider. Physics for this are set to cannot move as it doesn't need any physics. You should now have a level three layout with the new actors in place. Everything should be organized into their own layer. Time pickup, crumbling blocks and push buttons on the new actors for this level, adding new interest for the player. You should also have the GUI icon set in place and anchored to the screen under the events section. It should be gravity of 55 and the GUI behavior attached to this scene with minutes starting at five and there are 30 jelly beans in this level. Test the scene to ensure it works OK. GUI text is correct. We want to check that there are no issues or bugs in this level.
Navigate the scene in the way that the player would, looking for any issues. We will make the buttons work in the next session. OK, this may be an issue. It is difficult to land on the flame out enemy here. You might want to leave that as a challenge, but I will probably sort this out to make it easier to progress. And the water drop is too close to the health pickup. So as soon as you've picked up the health, it damages uh, your player. And that's an issue as well. We've got a few things to fix. So first I will move the flame out enemy a bit to the left. Then we'll move the water drop more to the right. This gives the player more room to collect the health without losing it straight away. I might also move this platform more to the right to ensure the player can reach the other platform easier without hitting the crumbling blocks. We now need to get the buttons to switch on the movement of the platforms when they are pressed. Go to the Actors Behaviour category and you can see two back and forth horizontally behaviours. One is for the flame or enemy and the other is for the moving wooden platforms. Open the first of these and we are going to modify this behaviour. Create a new boolean attribute and call it moving. We can then set the movement on and off using this. Add a conditional if statement and an equals comparison. The moving attribute goes into the left and true in the right. Now drag all this code inside the if statement. Then right click and duplicate all this. Change this to false for the second if statement. Drag out this last line of code and duplicate it. Now we are going to set the X speed for the platform to actually be zero if it is not moving. So it will not be moving in the scene because it doesn't have any speed. This controls the initial movement of the platform on when created. Now click the updated. Create a new boolean attribute called first move. Add a new conditional if statement below the other code and an equals comparison. First move attribute will go in the left and true will go in the right. In when created, right click and copy this line of code, paste it back into the updated event. This sets the initial speed for first movement in the correct direction. Now add another conditional if statement and another equals comparison. Check if the moving attribute is equal to true. Put all this code inside this if statement, ensuring it only runs if moving is set to true. This is fine. 
growing debug doesn't need to run, so uncheck it. Close the tab to save the code. Go to the Actors category and open the Wood Platform Moving Actor. The new attribute parameters are now available under the Behaviors section, allowing us to set moving on and off for the platforms. You do want all the moving platforms moving by default, so edit the code and go to the Attributes tab at the bottom right. Set moving to be true by default. Okay, for some reason that is not showing up in the behaviors. Well, let's just tick it to be on by the default. On the behaviors section, we do want to have control over whether it is moving or not. But first move should be set by code, so we don't actually need to see this here. Edit the behavior and go to the attributes tab at the bottom right and check hidden for the first move attribute to hide it from the behaviors section. I'll we'll create a new custom event under the advanced section. Call it Begin. This will turn moving on or off in the code. You can move events up and down in the stack using the up and down buttons here. Drag in a set first move attribute and make it true. And do the same with the moving attribute. We now need to trigger the begin from the button code. So let's create a new actor behavior and let's call it push button. We might have to call it push button code as push button already exists as a name. Create a new event. It's going to be a collision with an actor of type. So set the first to be self since that is the push button. And the actor of type should be player. Drag in the conditional if statement. And then go to the collisions and we want to check if the top of actor 1 was hit. Go to the actors section and to the draw category and we want switch animation 2 for self. We actually want to change the animation to the off position, or rather the on position of the button. So type on in the first parameter. You also want to trigger an event in a different behavior. So we don't use that one, but we use for actor, we use the top one. Now the behavior is going to be back and forth horizontally and the name is going to be begin. So begin goes in the first parameter. And we have to type in the name of the behavior, which is back and forth horizontally. Now, I don't think you can actually access it from any of these drop downs, unfortunately. So you are going to have to type this in. Just make sure that it's ex typed exactly the same as the behavior. So when the player hits a button, it will actually trigger uh, the behavior in another 
um, actor behavior. Create a new attribute and let's make it an actor type. No, let's check this. Choose attribute. It is looking for an actor, not an actor type. So it's on actor by default and let's call this one wood platform or just platform. We can now select that by choosing attribute and we can see their platform, which means that multiple platforms can be set up for each button. This is the power of using attributes in code. Let's finally assign this to the push button. As you can see, the platform attribute is there, but it needs to be configured or set up in the actual scene. You want to set up the code for when the player jumps on the button. It should activate a specific moving platform. Click on the button and in the inspector window, customize the code. You can now see we can choose a platform actor. So choose the platform near the button. Click on the wooden platform and customize this code and uncheck moving so that it will be still until the player jumps on the button. Do the same for the next button and choose the wood platform nearest to it on the left. And set up this last button, selecting the wood platform directly below it. Now all the other platforms are moving to begin with. And move the player closer to the button for testing purposes and then test the scene. The wood platform is still to begin with. There's an issue with these water drops here. So when we jump on the button, the platform does begin to move, but it doesn't stop. It just keeps going to the left. So we need to fix this bug. First, let's fix the water drops. They are simply colliding with the platform because they are too close to it. So just lower the spawn point a bit. And you can use the uh, cursor keys on your keyboard to do that as well. Now let's fix the platform so that it moves left and right. Open the back and forth actor behavior. But when created is fine, the issue is the updated. This final if statement needs to come down to the bottom. Actually this that is causing the problem is it's causing it to go continuously to the left. So the first move is set to true and the movement command is overwriting all the other commands. And it's never set to false. So it should only run once when it first starts moving, but when it reaches the end, it should be turned off. So drag in a set first move attribute and place it in the first if statement and also the otherwise if statement. And you want to set both of them to false. This switches this command off after it has reached the left limit. So test the scene now to ensure it works. The water drops are now working. And when we jump on the wooden platform, it now works. Great. Now we need to sort out the distance traveled for the platform. This ensures you can then jump on the crumbling blocks. Drag this platform further over to the right and increase the distance left and right to 120 in the inspector. Now 
Test the scene to see if it works. You may need to test it a few times to get it just right. Let me give that one another go, see if I can do it this time. No, it didn't go far enough to the left. Uh, sorry, to the right. So it needs adjusting. Set these to 140, if that works. So test again. Now it's actually too far to the right. Uh, so I'm gonna make that a task for you to sort it out, uh, to make sure it's in the right place, and also to test the other platforms to ensure that they are also working right. I've adjusted the platform to 150 in each direction, which enables the player to make the jump onto the blocks. We now want to start to, uh, sort out the crumbling blocks. The player jumps on the moving platform and is able to jump on each of the blocks and they should crumble away. Open the crumbling block actor and click on events. It is going to be a collision event with an actor of type. Set the actor of type to be the player. Go to the Actors category and the Draw section and drag in a Switch Animation command. Now it starts by default as Still and we want to change to Crumble when the player touches it. And once again remember to spell the name the exact same way as the animation. Count the time it takes for the animation to play. About 700 milliseconds. Go to the flow category and this time, uh, sorry, in the time section and drag in a do after seconds, type in 0 0.7, which is a 700 milliseconds. Then destroy the block by using the kill actor command. Test the scene to ensure it now works. Uh, I missed, but the animation works. At the end of the level is the time pickup. You need to make this work so that it adds an extra minute to your time when you pick it up. If you open the player, you will see he has the pickups behavior attached. You will need to modify this. You should have a collision event with actor type that is set to a time pickup. Then you will set minutes to minutes plus one. Finally, kill the last collided actor, which is the time pickup. For testing purposes, drag the player closer to the time pickup. And test the game to ensure it works. Great, we went from five minutes to six minutes. You can now put the player back in the start position.
To finish this level, we need to sort out the door by adding a region box around it. Go back to World Editor and click on the door and customize the behavior in the inspector. There are 30 jelly beans on this level and set the scene to level 3 for now. We can also now link level 2, so open that scene, click on the door and choose level 3 in the inspector so that it transitions to level 3 after you have completed level 2. We are almost finished with level 3, but there is something we have to fix. Notice this water drop here is falling out of the screen. It is never being destroyed, so it stays in the memory. The longer you play, the more water drops enter memory, and eventually it will cause your game to lag. We should kill the drops if they exit the screen. And this takes them out of the memory and keeps your game running quite quickly. You can see it would take a while before your game actually does start to lag. Open the water drop actor and go to the events section. You can see it has only ever been destroyed if it collides with something. Add a new actor event and specific actor enters or leaves the scene or screen. Set it to self exits the screen. Then kill the actor. This will then destroy it when it leaves the screen and optimizes your game. I'm going to put the player back to the beginning of the level, and level 3 is now complete. Click to create a new scene and call it level 4. And the width is going to be 120 tiles. Make the background black. Now you will lay this out according to the level 4 layout image, which you can find in the resources for this session. There is also some art for you to bring in as well. So there's dynamite, an explosion, and a weak wall. Now the layout is very much similar to the ones that you've used before and you can use the grid pattern to help you to lay that out. So by now you should be quite familiar with this and place in the new elements as well, the weak wall and the dynamite pickups. The explosion we're going to create in code. You also need to make sure that you place the GUI elements on the new level 4 in the same way that you've done with level 3 and level 2 and level 1 and set out the other elements as well such as gravity etc. So let's see if you brought these in correctly. So uh, the actor types you should now have dynamite which is a single frame non-looping. The collision is quite close to the dynamite so using these numbers. And for the physics, it's on cannot be pushed and can rotate is set to no. The explosion is an animation. Ensure that it's not looping because we only want it to play once. Uh, there is no collision on this one. And the physics simply cannot move. And the weak wall is just a single image as well. Uh, the collision. Uh, general square collider and cannot move for the physics. Okay, so let's take a look at the level four. So you should have laid this out. Um, you've placed in the new elements, the weak wall and the various dynamite pickups. And you've also got a button as well, which should be linked to your wooden platform moving. Uh, which you did in the last session, so you should be quite familiar with that now. 
and then show that this one is set to moving is unchecked. So we want it to be still to begin with. And you should also have your GUI elements as well. Anchored to the screen under the events and the behaviors for the GUI the time start is six minutes and the total beans is 55 for this level. And for the door, this one should be set up and it's basically linking to itself. So it has its own region. Oh, jelly beans is 35 and the scene just linking to itself until we create level five. Now under level three, just ensure that you've also linked this level to level four. We now want to set it up so that when you pick up the dynamite, you're also able to plant it. But in order to plant it, you're gonna press the T key. So click on settings and then controls. And you can see that these are the default controls that have been set up. All we need to do is click here to add a new control. The name of it is going to be T and we just simply type T in there and we've created a new control. Let's click OK. And now we can access that in the next session. Open the level four scene. And we're going to work on picking up the dynamite and having that disappear when we pick it up. And then it's going to appear in the GUI section next to the key. So let's go to actor behaviors and double click to open pickups. We're going to add a new event to this. It's going to be very similar to the other ones. So click add event. It's going to be a collision with an actor of type. And the actor of type is going to be dynamite. So when cell fits dynamite, now we're going to create a new game attribute. It's going to be a Boolean that is false to begin with. And we're going to call it have dynamite. Now we want to set it so that when you walk into the dynamite, indicating to us that you have picked it up. So set have dynamite to true. And then we want to go to actors, properties, and we want to kill the dynamite. So change this from self to last collided actor. Now we want to ensure that you start without the dynamite. So let's go to basics and when created. We want to go to game attributes and we want to set have dynamite to false. We don't want it displaying as soon as the level starts. Great. Now we can close pickups and save this. Okay, go to actor types and we're going to do something with dynamite now. So let's duplicate this one and rename to dynamite GUI. We've got the game object and the GUI object for display purposes only. Let's open this one. Let's go to events. Now we're going to do something in events or actually maybe not. Maybe we can take a look at actor behaviors and let's go to the display key. Now we already have this. We can actually reuse this, I think is what we'll do. So let's go to Dynamite GUI. Well, first of all, let's duplicate display key. And let's rename this to display dynamite. And let's open that. Now this one's fine when created. Under the updating, all we need to change is this. So get rid of the av key and replace it with av dynamite. And the rest of it should work fine. This is ensuring that it just runs for one frame instead of um, clogging up the updating. We can now close this.
Actually, let's attach it first. Where is this key GUI? This is something that really should only be set inside of code. We don't actually need to see this. But it appears there. We don't, we don't really want players changing that, but anyway. <laughs> Let's go to the actors and let's take the dynamite GUI and place it in the scene. Now under the events, we're going to right click and we're going to duplicate one of these anchors and we're going to change its actor to the new dynamite that we've just placed in there. Great. Now let's take our player and move him a little bit closer to the dynamite so that we can test this and then test the scene. Okay, so walk into the dynamite to see what happens. Great, it appears and the dynamite has disappeared out of the scene as well. Now let's open the dynamite. We're going to go to our collision. We're going to change this to it is a sensor. Okay, so we're on level four and we'd now like to set it up so that there's a message when we pick up the dynamite to be displayed here on the bottom. So in behaviors, we're going to add the behavior message manager that we worked on before. Now we need to create a region box close to where the dynamite is. And the behaviors we can now choose that region. And the message ID, well, we need to go into the GUI behavior and edit this behavior. Now we currently don't have a message, so we need to duplicate the last one. This one's called message ID 5, which doesn't actually exist at the moment. We do want to deactivate the message. So let's go into GUI and let's duplicate this last uh, this button if. Great, and let's put it into place. And we're going to call this one message ID 5, and then we're going to type on here Press T to plant dynamite. So this is just an instruction that when we want to put dynamite down, we will press the T key on the keyboard. Now, as long as we are in that region, it should display. So let's test this. Great, and it's saying it already. Press T to plant dynamite. Pick it up. And as soon as we leave, it's destroyed it, so it shouldn't display it again. Okay, now that we've got that first message working, when you pick up the dynamite, it's saying press T to plant dynamite. Now most players will try and press T immediately. We need another message down here, it's simply going to say you need to be near a wall in order to plant the dynamite. Let's go back to dashboard and to actor behaviors. And we're going to create a new actor behavior. Let's call it next to the wall. And we need an event. Well, first of all, we need to create an attribute. And this one's going to be a Boolean. And we will call this near wall. Now, obviously, it doesn't show up until we create an event. So basics and when creating. 
We go to our attributes and we can see that near wall boolean is set to false to begin with, which is good. We now go to our setters. We set near wall to false to begin with, just as a security measure to ensure that it is false. Attach this to the actor type and this one is going to go on weak wall. We can see that we've got a checkbox if we want it. Okay, we're going to hide that checkbox because we don't want people inadvertently setting that. So let's add a new event. This one is going to be an actor event and it's going to be enters or leaves a region actor of type. So choose actor type and this is going to be the player. Enters, now the region, we're going to create an attribute for this one. So choose the region type and we will call it wall region. Now that we have that, we can choose the attribute wall region. Go to our setters and set near wall to true. So as long as we have entered the wall region, we're now setting that to true. Let's duplicate this event. Double click to rename. Let's change this to exit region. And obviously change this one to exit. And now we can set near wall back to false again. Let's create a new add event. It's going to be an input and keyboard. Now we're going to choose our control and we have a T up there. And under the flow, we're going to go to if. Anything equals anything. Game attributes and have dynamite is going to go in the left and true is going to go in the right. So as long as you have dynamite is true, you've already picked up the dynamite. We can then run some more commands. Drag in a new if statement. And now it's anything not equal to anything. We go to attributes and near wall is not equal to true. We're going to go to game attributes, set setters, I'm going to set message ID to. Now this is where we need to write our new message. So under scene behaviors, let's open GUI. We're going to duplicate this last if statement. And then put it all back into place again. Now this is message ID equals six this time. And we're going to write a new message. I'm going to say, put it next to a wall. And we're going to put six in this one. Okay, so it tells the player where they need to put the dynamite. Now back to flow again and time. And we're going to say do after zero seconds. Now type in here, do after two seconds. We're going to set message ID back to zero again. So it's only going to display the message very quickly. We want to ensure that it doesn't display the message for the entire level. Okay, I'm just going to close these and I'm now going to draw a region around the weak wall so that we can set this up. Now go back to world editor mode and let's click on the weak wall and go to the inspector and we're going to customize some reason that's the wrong code. <laughs> Let's delete that one, go to palette, and we're going to add a new weak wall. So it refreshes the code. Now when I click on this one, an inspector, that's the correct one. So we can now choose the wall region. Is region two. 
Okay, so we'll test the scene and we should be able to see this working. Well, we pick up the dynamite and as soon as you press T, you get to put it next to a wall and it disappears nicely. That is exactly what we want. And it will display it every time that you press T and you're not near a wall. Okay, so we're now going to set it up so that when the character picks up the dynamite and they're next to the wall, we can plant the dynamite and it can explode and blow up the wall. Go to Dashboard, Add to Behaviors, and let's reopen the next to wall behavior. Now it's actually the keyboard event that we want, and we're going to add to this. So at the moment we have if dynamite is true and if near wall is not equal to true, we drag in another if conditional statement underneath the first one, another equals comparison, and now we're going to say if near wall is equal to true. So in other words, as long as we are near to the wall. We're going to go to scenes and we're going to create an actor type. We're going to be able to spawn in a new type of dynamite. So find the dynamite actor. Now the X and Y, we don't want a specific value. We actually want the actors X and Y, and this is the weak wall. Okay. But at the moment, if we simply put X and Y, it's going to appear right in the center of the weak wall. So what we're going to do is we want to offset the actual place where it's going to appear. So it's more like down there. We're going to do that using the numbers and text, and we're going to use minus. So the X is going to be X of self minus roughly about 15. And the X is the left and right. And this one is the Y. This one needs to be a plus because we actually want it to go down. Okay, y plus around 45 should do. We're going to put that one in there. Now we go to game attributes and we need to set message ID to zero. So we're going to switch off any messages that are appearing. Now let's uh, put our character up here and I'm going to temporarily put a stick of dynamite in so that I can allow the character to pick up the dynamite. Test the scene to make sure that this works. So I have the character pick up the dynamite. It appears in the GUI and I can press T. It says put it next to a wall. As I approach the wall, I press T and it appears near the wall, but it's still saying um, put it near to a wall. So there's a bit of an issue there, but now we're going to have it explode and blow up the wall. We are now going to work on actually destroying the wall. So once we've picked up the dynamite, planted it next to the wall, it's going to destroy it. I want to go to game attributes, setters, and set half dynamite to false. Okay, and that's going to switch off that message saying if you're next to the wall. Um, so what we want to do now, we want to go to time and do after zero seconds. And we're going to put this just underneath there. And we're going to say after two seconds. We're going to go to scenes and we're going to create another actor type. Okay, and this is actually going to be the explosion. So let's choose actor type and choose the explosion. Now the X and Y is actually going to be the same as these. There is a shortcut. It's, uh, I think it's control. No, nope. um, is it alt as you press? No, nope. I think it might be shift. If you press shift, that's the one. And you drag it out, it'll actually duplicate it for you. So press shift and click and drag at the same time. Okay, because we want those to be duplicates. We want it to appear wherever the dynamite was. We're going to go to properties and we're going to drag in a kill actor. We're going to place it above that one. We're going to say last created actor, which is the dynamite. And destroy the dynamite and then create an explosion. And then we want to go back to scenes again. And this time we're going to add a nice effect. So I think this one might be um, 
It might be view actually. Yes, yeah, view. Okay, we're going to shake the screen for zero seconds with intensity. Let's put it here and let's say roughly what? 0 0.2 seconds, let's say, very short. Um, and let's try around 30% intensity, see what we get. Now we've got to flow, and we say do after 0 seconds. I'm going to type in here. Go to actor types and open the explosion. We take a look at its animation. Let's count how much we've got. So we're around 500 milliseconds. Okay, 0 0.7, yeah, at least we'll leave the explosion a little bit afterwards. And let's drag in a kill actor and its last created actor. We don't want to destroy the wall. We want to try and destroy the... And then we destroy the wall after the explosion. So let's test this scene now to see what happens. We're going to pick up the dynamite. And the message has disappeared. It blows up the wall, but the dynamite's still there. Okay, let's fix that. But it kind of works. We just need to fix a couple of errors here. So the intensity was a little bit much, I felt. So let's lower this down to 5%. Now, do after 0 0.7 seconds, kill last created actor and kill self. For some reason, it's killing the wrong actor. I'm now going to fix the explosion uh, of the wall. What I've done is I've lowered this down to 0 0.3 seconds. So that when it says kill last created actor, it recognizes the dynamite was a last created actor. If do after seconds is too long, sometimes it doesn't recognize that that was the last actor that you picked up. So let's test the scene, see what happens. This one, 90% memory usage happens occasionally when you've been using stencil for a long time. To fix it, you just restart stencil. Okay, I'm going to press T. Great, now it works. Now, occasionally you, you might find that the explosion itself persists until the end. Uh, sometimes it doesn't actually always destroy it as it should. So, in order to make sure that that does happen, go to Actor Types and Open Explosion. And we're going to go to Events and we're going to make sure that it destroys itself. So, we're going to add an event. It's going to be a time after n seconds. We're going to say one second. Properties and kill actor. So after one second, it must destroy itself. Just make sure that this works a second time. Uh, something like this you might want to test several times to make sure it works perfectly. And yeah, that works fine. Now we're going to get it so that the dynamite disappears from the GUI at the bottom. And when we've planted some dynamite, we simply want to set have dynamite to false. Which we have already done. And now under the display dynamite, we just simply need to tell it that if dynamite is equal to false, it should fade out. So we're going to duplicate this one. I'm going to place it under there. And we're going to change true to false. And now we're simply going to fade out. We also need to change these two around as well. Key GUI equals true, and then we're going to set key GUI to false. The light switch method. So let's test this scene now. So 
Great, that worked. And it disappeared from the GUI as well. So we've already completed levels one to four. We're now gonna create a new scene and call it level five. The width should be 150 tiles. And make the background black. So these are the actors that we're using so far. But for this level, we need to bring in some new actors. So you can find these in the resources for this session. So we have the arrow spawn, the arrow and the ladder for this, uh, for this particular level. So if you can bring these in, set them up. Uh, the ladder doesn't need a collider. We're going to use a region for this to activate it. The arrow will need a collider. The arrow spawn doesn't. You can also find the level five layout in the resources. So just as you've done before, lay out the scene. And you will be also adding the new components, the ladder, etc. The button will activate this particular platform. And you may have to tile those ladders as well. This platform will already be moving and the crumbling block should already work. We've got a weak wall that will need to be destroyed by dynamite. This platform is already moving and this one should already be moving. Now we've got this button that should activate this platform here. And this is the dynamite for the weak wall that we saw earlier. Also got a time pickup. And these platforms are already moving as well. We've got the crumbling blocks and we've got a flame out enemy as well, spikes and the door. And you will need to set up the door as well. So remember that you can use the grid in order to help you to lay out the scene. And just as you did with level four, you will need to place the GUI items on the screen as well. Behaviors, you will need a GUI and a message manager. And the physics should be set up to 55 for gravity. So you should now have a completed level five layout. You should also have in the actor types an arrow, which is just a single image, not looping. Um, the collision should be quite close to the arrow using these numbers. And the physics cannot be pushed and can rotate set to null. It should be an arrow spawn. Again, it's just a single image. There is no collision on this one. And the physics cannot move. It doesn't need any physics. It could also be a ladder. Again, just a single image, not looping. There is no collision on this. The physics cannot move. It doesn't require any physics. Great. Now on the scenes, let's take a look at level five. Should be laid out according to the image. And everything should be placed on its own layer to keep it organized, as well as there being these GUI elements in place, the behaviors, the GUI behavior, time start is around five, total beans should be 45. We also have a message manager as well that is um, message ID number five. Now the region should be around a dynamite. Just there, region zero. And that's obviously message five, uh, which tells you what to do with the dynamite. And it will deactivate once we leave that region area. Under the physics, 55 for gravity. And under the events, these are anchored to the screen. This button should also have been set up to activate this wooden platform, which is this one. This wooden platform should also be have its moving unchecked. Now this one has not been customized, so this one will move automatically to begin with. And we have the ladders that are tiled. And this particular button should be linked to this wooden platform. And this platform should have its moving unchecked. 
And these two I'm moving to begin with. Now for the door, this one should be set up to its own region, which you can see just there, region two. And it's 45 jelly beans, so it knows how to count them. And it simply links back to level five. Now while we're here, we can go into level four and we can link the door level load to the next level. So choose level five. We are now going to create uh, the ladder code. It's going to allow our player to climb this ladder when he's near there. In order to do this, we're going to create a region around the ladder. So when the player is inside this region, he will be able to climb. Let's go to Actor Behaviors and let's create a new behavior. And we will call this Climb Ladder. So this is going to require an event. And it's going to be an actor's event when uh, an actor of type enters or leaves a region. Obviously this is going to be the player. It's going to be enters a region. Now we want to set this region up as an attribute. So let's create a new attribute of type region. Let's just simply call this ladder region. Now under the region setting, uh, we can choose attribute ladder region. Great. And let's create another attribute. This one's going to be a Boolean and we're going to call it climb so that we know if the character is climbing or not. We're going to go to setters, we're going to set climbing to true. Okay, so we're going to set this attribute to true. Now we need to duplicate this. So right click and duplicate. We're going to double click, change its name to exits region. All we need to do is just simply exit this and then change set climb to false. So it knows we're no longer in the region, so we cannot climb. Add another event, and this one is going to be a when updating. Now let's create a new attribute. I'm going to call this player. It's going to be of type actor. I'm going to create another attribute. It's going to be another Boolean. And let's call this one Still, okay. Now go to the flow category and bring in a conditional if statement and then an equals comparison. Nope, we don't need an equals comparison. Actually, we need a user input on this one. So it's gonna be control is down. I'm gonna choose control and it's if we're pressing the up control. Now we're going to go to attributes and we're going to go set still to false. Go back to our flow category and we're going to say otherwise. So in other words, otherwise, as long as we're not pressing up, we're going to set still to true. Now it can detect whether we're pressing up or not. We go back to our flow. I'm going to drag in another conditional if statement and we're going to drag in an AND Boolean operator. And then we're going to say equals in one side and equals in the other. Go to our attributes and we're going to put climb in the far left. And we're going to uh, check if this is equal to true. Which will be if we've entered the ladder region. We're going to say if in the other one still equals True. Back to no. This should actually be false, shouldn't it? In other words, as long as we're not still, we're actually pressing the up button and we're inside the region. Let's drag all that in there. Then we need to come to the actors and we need to set X for self. 
we're going to change this to Y because we want to go up and down the screen. Now we're going to choose Attribute because we want to link it to the player. And we're going to drag this one in for now, X of self, and then we need some numbers. Now we're going up the screen, so we need a 0 minus 0. I'm going to type in this about 1. We're going to change this to Y. So as long as we're pressing up and we're inside the region, we're going to advance roughly one pixel up the screen on when updating. Now let's attach this to, we're going to attach it to the ladder. Okay. Uh, and we have a ladder region, we have a player region. We don't actually want to see these. We don't want to see the climb and the still because they're set by code. Let's go back to the climb ladder behavior. Let's come down to our attributes. Let's just uncheck, uh, sorry, check these so that they are hidden. Now, this needs to be set uh, to two, two pixels because one is not going to get the character high enough on the ladder. So setting this to two, we can now double click on the ladder, go to the behaviors, and we can see that those fields are now hidden. Well, let's click on the ladder. And we can go to the inspector and we can customize. Now it doesn't show up. So what we need to do, we need to close everything and reopen uh, the scene. Let's now click on the ladder, customize, and we, now we can see these. We can choose the region. And we can also choose the player. Now let's test the scene. Let's walk over to the ladder. Now I'm inside the ladder region. I press up and now I can climb the ladder. Okay, so we've got this first ladder working. Now our character can climb this. But we also have other ladders as well. So let's just set these up. So let's draw a simple region around this first ladder. We can go back to World Editor. Now if we click on this bottom ladder, we can customize and we can choose the region around this ladder. And then we can also choose our player. So all we need to do to get that ladder working Let's do the same with this ladder. So draw a region around it. Back to World Editor and let's click on the bottom ladder. Let's customize. Choose the region around this one. And then obviously choose the player. Now we want to make sure that these are going to work just fine. So let's drag our player a little bit closer to the ladders. And then we can test the scene. Now our character climbs the ladder, which is very good. Whoops, I just died. <laughs> and this ladder works as well. Great. Now going to work on um, creating our spawn for the arrows on a level five. So let's just put our character back to the beginning of the level. And we want to create the arrow up here. Okay, it's going to fire as we try and press that button. So let's go to our actors section and on to our objects layer and let's find our arrow spawn and put that into the scene. About there we'll do. Just at the right height to hit our character. Let's go back to dashboard. And we're going to go to our actor behaviors. We actually already have a spawn point and this one's for the water drop. We're going to do something very similar to this. So let's create a new behavior. Let's call this one arrow spawn. Can't have that. So arrow spawn point. Back to dashboard and 
There's our arrow spawn point. Click add an event. It's going to be time and it's going to be every n seconds. And just as we see from the water drop every two seconds, we can use the same for this. We can say every two seconds. Go to the scenes and we're going to create a new actor type. We're going to spawn it in. So we're going to choose the actor and it's obviously going to be the arrow. The X and Y are going to be the X and Y of the spawn point. So that's X of actor in the first one and X of actor and change that to Y. And that's the X and Y of self. Now well, let's try Y center on that one. Go on X center. So it doesn't start at the top left point of the actor. Instead, it starts in the center of the actor. Let's attach this to the arrow spawn. Now we need to go to our arrow. We're going to go to the events and we need to get this moving. So let's add an event, basics and when updating. Let's add the actors category and we're going to set X to drag in an X of self, numbers and text, and then we're going to drag in a plus zero plus zero. X of self in the left and we're going to say plus two in the right. We're going to put all that in there and that's going to cause the arrow to, to move by two pixels every frame to the right. Let's just put that character up here a little bit and we should now be able to test the scene. Should be able to create arrows now every two seconds. There we go, it's creating arrows. Now, unfortunately, it is firing out of the bottom of the spawn point. You might actually want that. It's the character, and at the moment it's not doing any damage, but it is nicely pushing the character, which is very interesting. But the arrows are constantly coming out and, and they're not being destroyed. It means that this level is not very well optimized. So we will need to fix that. Go back to dashboard. Let's double click on arrow again. Go to events. We're going to add an event. It's going to be actors, enters or leaves the scene or screen. And we're going to say specific actor because it's obviously self. It's the arrow itself. It's going to be exits and the screen. Simply want to kill the actor. And this optimizes the scene. Let's double click back on arrow spawn. Let's go to behaviors. We're going to add a new behavior. We want to always simulate to ensure that it's still firing arrows even when we're not on the screen. Um, now, obviously, they're not going to attack us when we're off the screen, but we, we need to make sure that once we're not in range, that the arrows are not going to hit us. So let's just test this moment it should be firing every two seconds destroying the arrows when they leave the screen okay still firing okay now we want to create it so that the arrows do damage to the player you've already done this numerous times before but we're, we're going I'm going to show you how to set this up so let's go back to active behaviors and let's go to the player damage behavior let's open this and it's just a case of duplicating this first one. Fact. Let's duplicate this one. Play more damage. And let's just double click and rename this. So we want it to be arrow damage. Okay, and now when self, it's a choose actor type, it's going to be an arrow. Okay, the top of actor two, we're going to take this out. We're going to go to our collision section. We actually want to say the right side of actor two, which is the arrow, because we obviously want to get hit by the, the sharp end of the arrow. Okay, so if the right side of actor two was hit, if loser life is equal to true, then it's going to set loser life to false and it's going to trigger the damage event. Okay, so it will only run for one frame. Great, that will work. Now we're going to duplicate that one. I'm going to put it going to get rid of all that. We don't actually need that. We're going to put this underneath there and put this back. 
Now we're going to say if the right side of Actor 2 wasn't hit. So in other words, if we're jumping on the top of it or something like that, we're actually just going to kill the actor. Now we're not going to kill the player, we're going to kill the last collided actor, which is the arrow. It's going to allow us to destroy the arrows without taking damage. So let's test the scene and see if that works. Great, so the arrow does damage to us. Well, and we can kill it. We can jump on top of it. Now we do actually have to get it to die when it hits us, because at the moment it's just continuously pushing us out of the way. So let's do that. It's going to be here. It's going to be around here somewhere. So let's go to Actors and let's just drag in a Kill Actor. And we want it above the trigger event. Obviously it's last collided actor and that will actually destroy the arrow and still trigger the damage event. Test the scene again to make sure this works. Great, that works. Now I'm going to fix where the arrows are spawning from. The moment they're coming out of the bottom, I want them more toward the center. Do this, I'm going to go back to Actor Behaviors, to the arrow spawn point. It's actually under the Y, so Y center of self. I want to actually increment that. So I want to drag in the 0 minus 0, Y center of self, minus an extra 10 pixels. So it's going to move it up 10 pixels. Let's test this scene. Great, now they're coming out of the center of the arrow spawn point, which is exactly what we want.